All right, here we go with our next chapter, which is chapter 8, looking at the Islamic world. And here is your video lecture. So when we look at the Islamic world, we're going to start right here in Arabia. Uh, Arabia, uh, for the most part of world history up to this point, had played very little role. Uh, and for numerous reasons. So you have these like huge empires like the Persians, uh, the Byzantines, and the Romans, right? Uh, they all existed nearby. Uh, but Arabia, for the most part, because of its climate, its geography, its deserts, uh, have played a very sig insignificant role until around the year 600, where we see a drastic change thanks to the creation, the birth of, a, of the last major world religion, which is Islam. Uh, so here we see the geography again, most of the Arabian Peninsula is this big, gigantic desert, um, which makes it very difficult, of course, to have permanent settlements. Uh, but there are some exceptions, uh, and let's talk about that now. So uh, the Arabs, of course, are the people that live from uh, live in the Arabian Peninsula, and they set up this uh, train network across the deserts, right, uh, that... Um, that they were able to maintain because they were the ones who domesticated the camel, which of course facilitated trade across deserts. Uh, and they lived in these small little villages uh, called called oases, right, where there's underground water supply, and which allows them to, uh, ha you know, be able to grow enough food for a population in these small towns and villages. Uh, so at this time, we see that you know, like I mentioned, these large empires. Uh, and surrounding Arabia, and for the most part, Arabia was, you know, just kind of there. Uh, but that's about it. Uh, then we have the Bedouins. So the Bedouins are, are a specific group of Arabs, right? And uh, they are nomadic. Uh, they herd animals, particularly, you know, goats and sheep and, and camels and stuff. Uh, and they go from one oasis to the next, um, looking for uh, places for food and water for their animals. Uh, and they're organized into clans, and each clan or tribe is led by a, a leader called the Sheik, and the Sheik uh, has a uh, council of elders, and they all kind of like work together to rule. And um, so because of the desert, we don't see widespread agriculture, so we don't see huge cities in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, but we do see a large, large number of tribes, you know, who kind of like control these trade networks across the peninsula. And uh, they are, of course, pastoralists. Now, when we look at their religion, uh, the Bedouin and the Arabs, uh, they were polytheistic, right? They were in, in the middle of all these major religions, so they had a lot of in, um, connection, uh, interaction with uh, Mesopotamian religions, Egyptian religions, um, and Christianity and Judaism as well. Uh, but they were, themselves were polytheistic. They had a whole bunch of different you know, natural gods, uh, but they believed that there was a supreme god, and they named him Allah. And uh, they also practiced idolatry, which is the belief in praying to objects, like little statues or paintings, uh, and thinking that the god actually like lived in these uh, objects, or that the essence or the power of the gods lived in these objects. So they would pray to the objects, uh, pray to the images, believing it, that they have a direct link with their gods. They also practiced polygamy, which was a, uh, a common practice in this part of the world where a man can have multiple wives. And this was a result of the constant warfare that the Bedouin tribes uh, participated in. So because uh, men were often being killed in you know, raids and battles with one tribe versus another tribe, it would leave a lot of women and their children um, at a disadvantage. So it became common practice to have multiple wives, assuming, of course, you can support them, uh, because there was more like, you know, an abundance of divorced or uh, widowed women uh, who needed, you know, some type of economic uh, or political security. Uh, also, when it comes to the religion, they don't have priests. Uh, so there isn't a single individual who claims to be directly connected to the gods. Everyone, they believe, had that same power, the same opportunity. Uh, to connect with the gods. Uh, so again, we have the Persians on one side, the Byzantines on another side, and the Arabs right here in the middle. Uh, so Mecca, let's talk about Mecca. So this gigantic building you see here in the center of this um, mosque, or this big temple, 
it is known as uh, the Kaaba uh, and the Muslims or before the Arabs before them uh, they they believe that this was kind of like the holiest of holy sites and that this is essentially where like the gods reside so it's kind of like a Mount Olympus to the Greeks uh, the Kaaba was to the Arabs so Mecca was the religious center of Arabia it was also one of the economic trade centers as well uh, a lot of the trade routes passed through Mecca uh, and it had a large enough uh, agricultural surplus to support a large city so a lot of people will come in, a lot of merchants and travelers will come in and they will pray to their many different gods uh, so they had like Christians and Jews and Mesopotamians and all other types of and Zoroastrians all sorts of people uh, and they had shrines and temples to all these different religions uh, so it was very like open in that sense and um, so Mecca became the, like this uh, place where people would go to and they believe again that the gods resided there and they had the idols and the statues and the images um, for people to have that direct connection to pray with their gods. Uh, and like I mentioned already, these three different religions, major religions of this time, right? So we have Christianity, which is the Byzantine, Zoroastrianism, which would have been the Persians, and Judaism, which you know had been around this area for a very long, long time. Uh, so these, you know, these religions had influence or had been part or had been mixing with the people of the Arabian Peninsula for a very long time. Um, so like I mentioned before, they had a lot of trade routes. So with the collapse of the Roman Empire and the one of the Persian empires right, at the end of the classical era, um, we see that more and more... Um, overland across desert routes uh, become more popular. Uh, so they had, you know, the sea routes of the Indian Ocean uh, and the Mediterranean, those were still up and running. But we see an increased use of desert trade, which means that the Arabs will slowly become more important when it comes to world history because they controlled these desert trades. Um, and uh, so they you know, as the major empires, the Byzantines and the Sassanids, as they are fighting each other, uh, that means other people need to pick up the slack when it comes to trade opportunities. Uh, and the, the Arabs are the ones who, who kind of take over that void, that absence left behind by conflicting, uh, by, by com the conflicting uh, empires. Uh, and in, into this, you know, kind of like chaotic political stage we see uh, the birth of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and Muhammad will be the founder of the Islamic faith. Uh, so Muhammad was a merchant. Uh, he, he was you know, running those caravans across the desert uh, from Mecca to other parts of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and he, he, he was uh, considered kind of like an upper class guy. Uh, not educated, but uh, widely respected. Uh, for being, you know, good in judgment and stuff like that. And he was very critical of the polytheism uh, in the sense that, you know, the people paid um, more attention to praying to the statues and, you know, taking care of each other. Uh, that the tribal loyalties, you know, if you make one deal with one person, they'll betray you just because you're from a different tribe. Uh, and the greed that the merchants, of course, had, you know, that they're willing to do horrible things to each other to take advantage of, uh, of uh, economic opportunities. So he was very critical of the Arab society and Bedouin society. And over time, uh, he believed that he would be receiving messages, revelations from God, from what he called Allah. And uh, he believed that an angel was speaking uh, to him and that the angel was speaking the word of God. And over time, he believed that he was the chosen prophet, the chosen messenger of God, the final one. Uh, and he claimed to be the continuity of the one singular God that we see in both Judaism and Christianity. Uh, so he began preaching and teaching people, you know, what he thought was the word of God. Uh, and since he was illiterate, uh, someone else had to write stuff for him. And eventually he starts gaining a small group of uh, followers that became the first Muslims. Uh, so a Muslim is someone who follows the Islamic faith. 
and uh, Islam basically means to submit. So they believe that a human needs to submit to the will of God. That basically, uh, we're powerless to, towards God and whatever God has planned for us, we need to submit and accept it and live with it. Uh, so uh, within his lifetime, his disciples, his followers wrote down his writings and this became their holy book known as the Quran. Uh, and like I said, he's considered the final prophet. So within the Islamic faith, within uh, Islam, they believe that God had chosen other people as messengers, right? Starting way back with Abraham, and then Moses, and then Jesus. Um, but they don't believe that any of these individuals are divine, or the Son of God, or, you know, God himself. Uh, neither is Muhammad. They're just humans, like special humans, chosen by God to be the messenger. Uh, so here we see a painting, an old Persian painting of uh, Muhammad receiving uh, the word of God through the angel Gabriel. And this is the Holy Quran, which is their uh, holy book or their scripture. Uh, Islam means to submit to the will of God. And again, the Abraham, these are known as the Abrahamic faiths so or the monotheistic.